everyone, and welcome to another spoiler review episode. Shannon, how are we getting from the Geek? Geek? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. 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 You know, we did this earlier. We didn't yeah, have a plan either. You know what? I'm so focused on the rundown of the show, I forget about the intro and the outro of the show. But hey, I think it worked out. I think it worked out. Yeah, we're jumping into Loki episode four here. We're going to have a lot of fun with it. And yes, we will definitely be diving into that end credit scene as well. I hope you all stayed to the end to watch that end credit scene. It was stellar. But this is a spoiler review episode. So if you haven't watched the episode, go and watch the episode. Then come back and join us, uh, and this will be your second to last spoiler warning uh, overall. But let's introduce ourselves. I am the Outlaw, John Roca, writer, producer, and host here on the Outlaw Nation, joined by my brother from the Geek Buddies there. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor where you may have seen me on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Silicon Valley, and Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And joining us yet again every week for these Loki reviews, the great Emma Five. Emma, please, how are you? I'm just great. Shannon, are those your golf clubs behind you? They are. <laughs> yeah, the golf claps with the golf clubs. I love it. Uh, <laughs> man, wh what an episode. Yeah, that's, that's. I think that's the greatest understatement <laughs> of the year. Absolutely. And joining us in place of our brother, Michael Vogel, who's on vacation in parts unknown, the great Laura <laughs> Kelly. Laura, how are you? Oh, I'm amazing. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. I am, you know... It's going to be hard to fill Michael's shoes, but I will do my best. I think if anyone can, you can. And uh, Laura, you have binged these episodes. You caught up and then you started tweeting about Loki nonstop. And I thought it was great. Some of the thoughts. <laughs> so I, I, I texted you. I was like, Laura, is there any chance you can sit in for Vogel? And you were like, hell yes. And you jumped aboard. So this is a great foursome we got. And we're excited to have uh, everyone aboard. Uh, to uh, to uh, talk about it today for sure. So um, let's jump into it. Uh, one last spoiler warning before we jump into the episode here. If you haven't seen the episode, go and watch it. Let's get our overall th thoughts, though, about the episode going around the horn. Emma, let's start with you. You did say what an episode, but what's your feeling coming out of episode four here of Loki? Okay, I feel like I'm up against another Baby Yoda situation. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how did Disney hide Baby Yoda? Nobody had any inklings about Baby Yoda going into the Mandalorian. True. So my takeaway from this episode is, how did they hide Richard E. Grant? Are you kidding me? <laughs> what? At wearing that outfit so perfectly, so perfectly. Yeah, absolutely. Also, also where is Frog Thor? Oh, I know. I'm we just have, saying. That's a great point. We have alligator Loki. We need frog <laughs> Thor. Shannon, what were your thoughts after episode four? What's your feeling now having seen the episode? Maybe more than once, knowing you. Uh, yes, yes. I did watch it more than once today. Um, <laughs> yeah, this, this is what was great about this episode is throughout the first three episodes, we've established these characters that we know and love. And this is the first episode. We got to mash them all together. Hmm. And we started to get a hint of what was actually going on. Um, you know, uh, Sophia DiMartino already, I mean, she, Ooh, such incredible. a, such a captivating yeah. performance episode three. I, re I really liked, I know some people thought they, they felt they were running in place. I really enjoyed it, but I was glad to see Owen Wilson come back. Um, we get a little bit more from Gugu and Batha Ra's Ravona. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was one, one to 10, like, you know, 10 all the way, like, and, and had I not looked at Twitter, I would not have known to stay around for that post credit sequence. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I had no inclination what was coming, but as soon as as soon as what happened happened, it was like, oh my gosh. All right, let's yeah. rewind it. Gotta watch let's it again. Go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I know people were bashing episode three, but I'm like, hey, do you know how these shows are constructed? You have to take a little bit of a moment in one of the episodes to kind of lay this foundation so that you can have an episode four. Come on, this is how these shows are constructed. Laura Kelly, what did you think about episode four here uh, in Loki? It just reinforced everything that I have felt about this season so far. I have absolutely loved this season of this show. Um, it makes me so sad that I think this is the only season that we're going to get of this. And that is just devastating because I absolutely love it. It's my favorite thing on TV right now. And you're right. I had to binge the first three episodes because my head was just elsewhere and mm -hmm. I had to get caught up. But I'm so glad that I did because I am just enjoying the hell out of it. This episode, uh, episode four of the Nexus event was 
particularly awesome, I think. I totally yeah. agree with everything that's been set up to this point. Um, I, I think that this is, I just like, now I can't wait. I can't believe I have to wait another week because up until now I haven't had to. And now I'm just like, how have you all been doing this? I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to dive into it. It's gonna be great. And I You're don't know right. who, who who didn't like episode three. I don't like, yeah. there, I don't think that there are any episodes that have been like, yeah lesser than any other so far i, I hate, just loved all of it yeah, yeah i i hate coming into i mean i i love and hate coming into these reviews every single week going i don't have any criticisms but i don't <laughs> really have any criticisms of this episode yeah. it just the whole thing is so well constructed and as we discussed i remember during episode two we we had this feeling that hey like nothing there are no wasted moments in this mm. and that mm -hmm. I think that anybody that maybe had some reservations about episode three, I definitely saw some people coming forward going, oh man, episode three was so not filler. So I think mm -hmm. that even those that maybe were on the fence about episode three, this recaptivated their interest in this series. Yeah. Sometimes you got to be patient here and get through an yeah. episode so you can understand why this episode exists chronologically in the order of the season that it does and what it's laying the groundwork for. And certainly we got a bunch of payoffs here at episode four. I love this thing. I watched it three times today because it's just stellar <laughs> writing, stellar writing, stellar direction. The score, yeah. the, the music cues, I think went off the charts incredible throughout this whole thing. Tom Hiddleston, if it was possible for him to go next level as Loki, he went next level as an actor with Loki. Sophia DiMartino matching him every step of the way in terms of what she's bringing to the character of Sylvie, a.k.a. Lady Loki, and everybody involved in this just bringing the hammer. Even uh, uh, Owen Wilson getting some really tender moments with him as he's discovering and his world is getting, as the kids say, say shook. He's you see him go through <laughs> all of that. I loved it all. So uh, let's dive into it without further ado. Once again, spoilers. So if you haven't watched it, get out of here. Go watch it. Come back. All right. We start off on Asgard. A young girl is playing with her toys, talking about a Valkyrie defeating a dragon to save Asgard. I think we can all guess that this is Sylvie, a.k.a. Lady Loki. Just then, a TVA portal appears and a younger Ravona comes through it with some Minutemen to arrest the girl for crimes against the sacred timeline. This is a little girl but she's being arrested. They reset the timeline. And then all of a sudden we cut to the young girl at the TVA. She sees a dude getting manhandled. Uh, and then she goes through all the TVA protocols that Loki did in the first episode. She confronts it. She's in front of the dude who tells her to sign the papers of her statements. She goes through that robot detecting security door and ends up in front of a TVA judge and just be and being held by Ravona just before uh, the case can even start. She uh, breaks free from Ravona, steals her temp pad, and disappears through a portal. Ravona does not stop her. There's a lot of curious behavior from Ravona throughout this whole episode, and it's got me thinking a lot about what her impetus is here, what her role is to play in all of this. Then we cut to present day Ravona in the elevator, in the golden elevator to the timekeepers. The doors open. She walks in. And we see them, and there is 80s, 80s sci-fi vibes all over this shot. Let's stop here because it's a great, great place to stop. Emma Five, hell of an opening, and those visuals, my lord, what did you think? Well, the timekeeper stuff was like straight out of Flash Gordon, and I absolutely yes. loved it. Um, obviously, that that that's something that we see in like Taika Waititi's work with Thor, like Thor Ragnarok has some very Flash Gordon vibes to it as well. And so right. I absolutely loved that, but I still definitely was in a headspace of when I saw the timekeepers, I still had this feeling of like, I don't know, something is, I've had this feeling the whole yeah. time that like something was not quite right with the timekeepers and yeah. you know, we'll get into it at the end of the episode, but, um, but then I, I guess I, I will defer probably to Shannon on this as our, our, uh, you know, real tinfoil hat comics yeah. expert here, yeah. but my question, I guess, is is in regards to Sylvie Loki mm -hmm. as to why she's identified as a variant at a very, very, very young age where she's mm -hmm. literally just a little girl. Is the idea behind it that, like, she's not supposed to exist at all, that she's yeah. not really a Loki? Like, it's such a – I have so many questions about it at this point, but in a, mm -hmm. in a good way, not in a, well, I give up kind of way. Right, right. Well, we do get a reference to Valkyrie, so that's great to hear right. that a, a Valkyrie. We don't know if it's the Valkyrie, right. but we get a reference to a Valkyrie. That's a great point. Here's my here's my sneaking suspicion okay. to answer your question. If in the comics, and Shannon, you you can uh, 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 touch base on this, 
Kang the Conqueror is connected to uh, to Ravona. Yes. Is Kang the Conqueror controlling Ravona to do all of this because Lady Loki ends up stopping him at the moment of truth for uh. him as he's about to take over the entire galaxy. So he's going back in time to mess with her and stop her from being able to stop him. And he's employing the woman he loves or cares about. And it looks like a little bit mind controlled or against her will doing these things that she, so that's my crazy out there hypothesis. I don't know if it's true or not. What do you think, uh, Shannon? What do you think about this opening scene? What do you think is going on here with the uh, young, Sylvia, young lady Loki? Well, just to address the thing that you brought up, that you just initially brought up. Um, yeah. See, I, I feel like it might be the reverse because I noticed as oh. well that there was that hesitation that Ravona didn't go after yeah. Sylvia. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, oh, is she letting her get away for some reason? Like, is there some reason right. does, does, does Kang, and again, we're, we're kind of mephisto ah. here a little bit, but is Kang letting her, is it like, let let Lady Loki go, let this child go, because mm. she's gonna do something that I need to happen, bop, 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 bop. Okay. That, that was my initial guess, but as soon as we see that opening shot of Asgard, ah. we're seeing the palace from behind, and I yeah. don't know if, I don't recall seeing that, seeing this in, in, in the films, but it, the mm. colors almost the color scheme looked a little different. Like there was right. that right. gold, but there were darker shades. And, and from the from the moment that happened, I was like, oh, so this is this is Sylvie's origin story right here. Yeah. Um, the the crazy thing is, you know, when the when the show first started, when the TVA first was, you know, brought onto the scene, um, immediately the internet is a great place when we get memes of the TVA bringing in Marty McFly and Bill and Ted. <laughs> it's like, oh, this mm -hmm. is really funny. But watching this happen to a child, yeah. if you want to talk about getting you getting you invested in a character right away, like if, if if episode three didn't do it for you, you see like she was taken as a kid and right. how heartbreaking that whole sequence is. Uh, yeah, the 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 moment that she sees that guy being manhandled and she yeah. says, you know, stop it, you get the sense like, okay, you know, this is not a bad kid. Like mm -hmm. this is this is not. I mean, she might be the goddess of mischief, but this is not this is not evil incarnate. This is someone who right. recognizes um, morality. Yep. And so, as you're watching it happen, it's like, oh my god, this is this is heartbreaking. You see, they they make TVA jumpsuits that little. Um, but then when they bring her in and she gets away, and we flash forward to Ravona, um, I definitely think Ravona is tied to whatever antagonist. Who yeah. has yet to be revealed? Whether it is Ken, yeah. whether it is Miss Minutes, whether it is some other entity, um, she doesn't seem. I mean, she seems tired by the whole thing. Yeah. And when she went in to go see the timekeepers, um, there was. Uh, it's funny. I got Bill and Ted vibes. I started thinking about oh, when they went to sure. the future. I see that too. Just, I see that too. In the world. Just yeah, sort yeah. of the floating shares. Um, yeah. But you get the <laughs> sense as she was walking in. I bought the fear and and the mm -hmm. the hesitancy which she went in with mm -hmm. so it'll be like when we get to the big scene at the end I i'll be curious to hear all hear your all's thoughts on whether she knew the whole time or not yeah i mean we discover this laura that uh through it last episode into this episode that every person who works for the tva was a variant now we get a, a shot of ravona as a minute man uh there in her outfit taking this young girl so is she a variant? Is she also doing this and not knowing that there's more? Or does she not want to go back to the life that she had before? So, she, so there's a lot of questions with Ravona. What did you think about this whole intro? What stood out for you? The whole intro with Ravona was definitely leaving me with a lot more questions for like the first half of this episode. Mm. Um, the fact that we sort of see her frustrated in her reaction to Mobius about letting little variant Loki Sylvie get away. Right. I just, you know, this was sort of my first clue, I think a little bit that, yeah, I think there might be something else going on here. I think she might be, I agree that she might be tied to like whatever antagonist is mm. actually at play here. And what I'd never even thought about actually was the fact that she may not want to go back to whatever her real life was before the TVA. Yeah. Um, that that's definitely some to, something to consider. And I hope we get into it eventually. Um, but yeah, these, the three timekeepers with the glowing red eyes, <laughs> all of the visuals in this episode were just on it was totally peak for me i really enjoyed it i really uh I, I gotta say with mobius wanting to talk about or wanting to talk to c20 
And, yeah. you know, I don't, maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but it's you know, like, the fact that, you know, he was talking about it's real, it's real. And, you know, yeah. this whole thing that it leads into as we get farther into this episode with Ravona, the more suspicious I get of her and the more I can sort of see through her being manipulative mm -hmm. of, of Mobius. But, you know, we see her in her younger age, so she didn't, it doesn't seem like she started that way. Yeah. So there's got to be some journey I'm kind of hoping that we get where we get a little bit more of her story, uh, right. her backstory and how she got to the, the position that she's in today. Yeah, and certainly we got that uh, with uh, Lady Loki. So, and I think we can't deny that she is a Loki. It's Asgard. She's there. She is a Loki. Yeah. What level to which she is Sylvie the Enchantress or Lady Loki, I'm sure we'll find out as we go along. But having Asgard there kind of confirms that a little bit. And certainly we saw with Lady Loki her getting – because when we first introduced her, she's killing Minutemen left and right. Now there's more of an understanding of why – also, you also get why she doesn't sit with her back to the door because that's how she got taken when she was playing with her toys with her back to the door. So you get that now uh, reaffirmed why she has that thing about it in her adult life as well. All right, we're back to the TVA. As Laura mentioned, Mobius is waiting on Ravona. She tells Mobius that the timekeepers blame her for this variant situation and for her letting him, you know, take Loki and go to these and have these conversations and for him escaping. Uh, she reaffirms that the timekeepers are all that stands between them and total calamity. Mobius pleads for access to Hunter T C20. She wants to, he wants to know why she keeps saying it's real over and over again. Ravona then reveals that she is dead, claims it was Sylvie who scrambled her mind and killed her, says she could barely speak, and then asks him to keep it between them. That she tr can she trust him? Uh, and I'm I wrote here so many cult vibes. Going off the charts here in this situation right now. Uh, she sends him out to find the variants, the two Lokis. We head to Lamentus One, and it's impending doom for our two Lokis, Loki and Sylvie. They have a great heart to heart here amidst the falling debris. Uh, Loki apologizes. Sylvie talks about remembering Asgard, the small time or the short amount of time she had on Asgard, remembering her family, remembering the people she knew there. And she says that the universe wants to break free from this time timeline. So it is manifesting chaos, which is why it created a lady Loki. And she says that the TVA took her as a child. So she stole the temp hat and ran. And now we know that it was her in the beginning. And she learned to hide in the ends of a thousand worlds because wherever she showed up, it would trigger a nexus event and they could find her quicker. So she learned where to hide. So let's stop there. Shannon, a lot revealed here. What do you think about all of this with her speaking about all the, uh, what's happening here, but also Ravona and Mobius, a deepening here of this connection, her kind of taking advantage of his affection for her, his respect for her to kind of uh, take her into her trust and lie to him, which we find out later about the death of C-20. Yeah, I mean, as we've already said, I mean, the evidence is mounting <laughs> that Ravona <laughs> is is tied to this antagonist. Whether or not she's been given the whole story, we don't really know. I mean, right. and that's what's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the next episode. As far as that scene with uh, Loki and Sylvie at the end of Lamentus, I mean, again, we've talked about we talked about the the budget and the care mm -hmm. that is put into these put into these Marvel uh, Disney Plus series. But just just a gorgeous shot, just beautiful, oh God, yes. like this destruction. You see just these, you know, these meteors, these shards of broken planet just plummeting down into the moon and how much they are both resigned to their fate at that moment. And I love Loki's line where he's just like, she was like, you know, maybe it is, maybe we are destined to lose. We're destined to die. And he's like, we're not. He's like, I've lost a lot, and painfully, he's like, but we, yeah, it's basically we're survivors. Mm -hmm. This is this is what we do. This is what it means to be a Loki: is that we survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just such a a perfect way to sort of encapsulate that character. Um, I had something else, and and it dropped out. Never mind. Okay. Oh, all right, let's move to Laura. Laura. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it's okay. If it comes back to you, just chime in uh, uh, when there's a spot here, Shannon. But yeah, Laura, this there's more here going on. Mobius and Ravona. What is this relationship? Mobius has been kind of in deference to her. You can tell he has kind of a crush on her from the beginning of this whole thing, wanting to be her only timekeeper, her favorite timekeeper. That kind of thing. So what do you, th oh, not timekeeper, sorry, her favorite, uh, uh, analyst. I don't know, analyst. analyst. There you go, analyst. Yes, her favorite analyst. So what do you think about this relationship and uh, what do you think about this this conversation between uh, Loki and uh, Lady S and uh, Sylvie there? Well, the relationship is definitely becoming more strained, which has been fun to see because I think, mm. yeah, it definitely started out more of like, really more of Owen Wilson 
putting the moves on her a little bit, sort of being yeah. playful. Um, and he's, you can definitely sort of see him, I think, pulling back at this point. Mm. Um, and her sort of, yeah, I, I like the cult mentality comparison because that's very much, I think, the vibe that she's going for and in, in really probably achieving up to this point. But yeah. I, I think the scene on Lamentus might have been one of my favorite scenes of this entire show. The, the music in this particular scene, mm. I mean, you know, lamenting indeed. It was uh, Natalie Holt is the one who does the music for the show yes. and finally prompted me to actually go look her up um, because the music in the show is just absolutely gorgeous. I can't yeah. wait till they actually release the full soundtrack to this because I'm hopefully I'm not just waiting forever. Uh, but the <laughs> the scene with Sylvie and Loki is just so touching. And I love this, like, I just love the chemistry that they have. They've established mm -hmm. that earlier, in, you know, in episode three, I think, and they're really like carrying it through in this episode, but it really kind of, it kind of begins here, I think for me. Mm -hmm. You know, this conversation is is so poignant, talking about how the universe wants to break free, and so it manifests chaos. Yeah. Um, and the fact that she was born the goddess of mischief just kind of got me thinking of like, you know, it, it wasn't her choice to be born. And I feel like it was, yeah. it's dating back to that where there was some sort of, you know, break in the sacred timeline. Like, why are we not addressing that? Why are we waiting until she's like, what, 12 years old mm -hmm. before we finally track her down? It's just, you know, it, just building on more of the questions for me. Does she have a Thor brother variant? I want to know all of yeah. these things. Uh, but point. the fact that she, yeah, escaped and then had to run for so long and she's escaping and or she's creating a nexus event everywhere she's going, where she's telling Loki this story and her background and her own words, I yeah. just found incredibly touching. Yeah. Um, especially where, you know, she gets to the part where she knows, I she mentions, you know, I grew up around these nexus events and now that's where I'll die. I suppose that's kind of poetic. It's just, it's tragic. Yeah, fatalistic approach uh, right at the end for her. For sure. Uh, Emma, uh, yeah, the cult vibes here. I mean, this idea of going into the golden elevator, see the elevated people who run everything. You know, uh, you can go through any religion or any cult, and it always seems to be set up that way. And there's always one person who is like the person who's guarding them and protecting them and making sure that you have earned the right to be in front of these people. So it's certainly all of that. And of course, they show up and it's, uh, it's some interesting looks. But what do you think about this conversation with Mobius and, uh, and uh, um, Ravona here and also with Loki and Sylvie? Okay, well, Ravona is in on what's ever going on at the TVA in some sure. capacity, whether sure. it is plausible deniability, uh, uh, willful ignorance. There's something going on with her wherein she wants to preserve whatever's going on there for some reason. It's very mm. possible that there could be a blackmail situation involved. It could go deeper. We'll find out, I'm sure, in the next episode as that's literally what was set up to lead into the next episode. But right. the, the thing with Hunter C20 is what really tells me that she's definitely in on the plan in yeah. some capacity because... As soon as she said, oh, she's dead, my immediate thought was, oh, you or somebody that's in on it killed her. Like, yep. she did not die from enchantment. And I couldn't believe, I could not believe, and we'll, we'll get into this later in the episode, that when we were talking about the last episode, I did not remember that Hunter B-15 had also been enchanted because that played Mice. in so much in this episode. So that was so satisfying. Oh. But again, it's like, Ravona's definitely she. She's one of the the devout. Uh, mm -hmm. She's she's happy happy to be part of the cult uh, in some capacity. Why we're not sure, but she definitely has more of an understanding of what's happening than say a Mobius who definitely has no idea that he wasn't in fact created by the Timekeepers and he himself mm -hmm. is a variant. And I think that this did a good job of immediately establishing why Mobius would have doubts because Mobius yeah. is a character who we've seen in his own way, kind of question the authority of the yeah. TVA in a, in a, well, I'm going to, I'm going to look around it because I, I think he's somebody that really sees the good in people. Like he's always yeah. really wanted to see the good in Loki and see Loki as a person and not just a variant that's ruining the timeline. Yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, and then listen, the conversation between Loki and Sylvie, who knew uh, that we would all be so okay with narcissism? <laughs> <laughs> That's no. true. <laughs> Loving the female version of yourself. They seem perfectly matched. They, seem they perfectly sure do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another part of this cult vibe, too, just to throw it in, is if someone breaks free from the cult and is trying to tell people what is going yes. on in the cult, they are immediately kicked out. They're hounded. 
sometimes you know they're persecuted uh, there have been uh, uh things of people being killed you know but as i was watching the johnstown massacre documentary that was on uh discovery great documentary by the way just was done last year exploring it again and you find out how jim jones was actually shooting people to keep them there so that they would drink the kool-aid with him so there's always people Oof. who are willing to kill the non-believers once they want to break out of the cult because they fear that the non-believers will destroy what they've constructed and the positions that they've achieved which is also having to do with narcissism. So there's a lot of that around the cults for sure. Uh, and I've only become a professional on it because I have a pandemic. That's the only reason. All right, let's move on. I've watched so many of those fucking documentaries. This is, anyway, this is, Ro this is Roka's new side hustle. Yes. I'm telling you, I, I watch everything. I mean, I'll, I'll go, I'll go babe, babe, there's a new one. There's a new one. I'm, I'm crazy. Anyway, all right. I watched some Australian one. It was madness. Anyway, uh, back to the TVA. Hunter B-15 and Mobius are looking for them, B for the Lokis, B-15 is visibly upset and wants news on Hunter C-20, which, I, I, are they good friends? Were they best friends? Were they, were they in a relationship? I don't know, but there's something here that has a strong connection between these two that B-15 hints at with her reactions. We head back to Lamentus, and the end is certainly coming now. Sylvie and Loki discuss, discuss what makes a Loki, the fact that we are destined to lose. No, says Loki. We may lose, but we don't die. We survive, something Shannon was mentioning. Loki gives her a pep speech, and then she touches his arm tenderly, kind of lovingly, and that causes a branch in the timeline. The fact that these two could come together in this way causes a branch of the timeline. Mobius asks, have you ever seen a timeline, uh, or sorry, a branch like this? And just as we're about to get a Rogue One or Deep Impact moment, Two TVA portals appear, and we cut to them being in the hands of the TVA in slow motion with those neck rings back on them again. They are separated into separate cells. Loki goes off with Mobius, and then these two dudes have a passive-aggressive battle about who betrayed the other one more than the other one. Loki calls him out for, oh, you're going to make some folksy crack about me. And Mobius goes, no, you're just an asshole. You're just an asshole. <laughs> then a red TVA portal appears. Loki tells Mobius that the TVA is lying to him after Mobius says, no, hold on, let him say one last thing to try to trick me. And he says the TVA is lying to him. Then he says, forget it. And he throws him, and they throw him into the portal. Loki ends up back on Asgard in a time loop with the great Jamie Alexander back as Sif kicking his ass over and over again for cutting some of her hair off. And I'm getting that Doctor Strange vibe with Dormammu, the time loop thing going on here. Then Loki, Loki scoffs at it at first, but after thinking, oh, yeah, I know what happened. I went and had a drink in a bath. But after a few whoopings by uh, Lady Sif, he's had enough. Then Loki tries to reason with her. And just as you think maybe he's getting through, he is met with another whooping by uh, Lady Sif. Um, and uh, this is just a little bit of a reference here. Uh, this is a kind of a reference to a Norse. And I'm sure Emma, Emma might be able to, uh, better to explain this, but it's a reference in Norse mythology that Loki was the reason that Sif's hair was black and not blonde. He magically changed it while she slept as a joke. So that's kind of a reference here to seeing her hair. Yes. So there hair. So uh, let's go to Laura. Laura, you're next up on the uh, here to go first. What do you think about this entire sequence between Mobius and uh, Loki? The the conversation between Loki and Sylvie before they go into the portals, and then Jamie Alexander kicking the crap out of uh, out of Loki in this. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I have to say that the lamentous scene here where we have like the tidal wave of Earth coming out that I saw mm. just looked amazing. Um, if, if I were to criticize one thing about the season so far, some of that lamentous stuff in episode three looked a little green screeny, a little bit shaky. <laughs> it looks, whatever they did, it looks amazing in this yeah. episode. I think they, they just knocked it out of the park. So it looks great. Um, I, I'm so happy that they saved them because I legitimately was worried. I'm like, what is the rest of the show going to be? I don't understand. There's six episodes, right? Like I'm not... I just no, am not keeping six. up close enough to know what's coming and what's not. Uh, but the fact that they talk, they have this conversation where, you know, where Loki is like, you know, we don't, we don't die. We survive. And he mm. tells her that like, she did amazing. And I just yeah. love this, like this really nice, like conversation he actually has with somebody where that feels very genuine. There's no lying. There's no deceit happening here. There's no sarcasm. This is like a genuine moment for Loki that I really appreciated. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the fact that it set off like a, you know, that very vertical branch off of the sacred timeline was definitely interesting to see. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping maybe we get some more of these to kind of figure this out and, mm -hmm. you know, 
watch more of these branches sort of take off and see how they react. But I imagine, you know, we're coming down to the end of the season. We may not. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that, you know, he <laughs> sticks him in that time cell um, <laughs> with Lady Sif was just hysterical to me. And then even more hysterical that he, it, it seemed to take him a little bit to like figure it out. Like the fact yeah. that he gets slapped and kneed in the groin twice back to back and then it just lets it keep happening. It was just hysterical to me. And I, at first I couldn't figure out what Sif was like holding in her hand. I'm like, is it? Is that a lock of hair? Like it just, it, I couldn't figure it out. But yeah, the fact that they, we have this sort of tie back to the Norse mythology mm -hmm. component to all of it is really interesting to me. I love that they brought it in and they're throwing in these little Easter eggs periodically throughout the season. Not Absolutely. that I know anything about them, but I love that you guys do and that I get the secondhand information from it. I think that's cool. So right on. Well, uh, Emma's our Norse mythology expert, so we go to yeah. you next. Uh, to please talk about this whole scene and about so, how this story yeah, connects. So the so the Loki myth uh, regarding Lady Sif is, I mean, it it is actually quite directly what happened in hmm. this episode. Uh, he very famously in one of the prose edda, I want to say. Um, shaved her head off she shaved all her hair off oh, um wow. and she yeah Yikes. she was like yeah she was basically known for like having like gorgeous hair and so he shaved it off and then basically what ended up happening was thor forces him to go and like have a he's gonna like fight him and loki's like no no no, don't worry about it i'm gonna go get this uh golden headpiece made for her to replace the hair that i shaved off so that's that's what that myth mm. is so the dwarves make her this golden headpiece and then also in that same sort of outing to the dwarves, I guess. They make um, Odin's uh, spear, mm. uh, Gungnir, I think it's called. Um, but okay. yeah, so that's that's what that myth is. It's, it's, it's like probably the most famous myth actually about Sif, because the thing about a lot of the goddesses in North mythology is that like, they don't do that much. <laughs> <laughs> what? I know it's sound right. <laughs> I know it's so weird. It's super weird. Um, yeah. So like all Sif does really in Norse mythology is be the wife of Thor. So, but this is again a very direct reference to something that actually happens in Norse mythology. But I totally got the Dormammu vibe there as well mm -hmm. of him going through the time loop over and over and over again. And in the moment where he is just so genuine and drops all the Loki bullshit. That to me was another, I mean, we, we've we talked already on this episode about yeah. how if it were possible for Tom Hiddleston to reach a next level of Loki, I mean, he truly does it here because he is yeah. so vulnerable and real while still being true to the character of Loki yeah. and admitting to the fact that he is a narcissist and he wants people to pay attention to him all the time. And it just, yeah, it was, it was so incredibly well done. Yeah, agreed, agreed. What do you think is going on between B15 and C20? Do you think there was a relationship, a friendship? They just certain comrades or yeah, I don't, maybe I, something more. It's it's interesting because we see certainly th particularly through the character of Mobius that just because these variants have been stripped of their identities doesn't mm. mean that they don't live and react as human beings. Right. So right. to me, it seems that it is very possible. I mean, be, especially because, you know, B-15 this whole time has basically said from the point that C-20's group went into the Loki trap and mm -hmm. she got kidnapped and enchanted, kept saying not C-20, like C-20's got this. So they obviously right. have a very deep understanding of one another, be that a romantic relationship or just a very close friendship. That mm -hmm. definitely exists. Yeah. And I wonder, well, we'll get to that in just yeah. a second. We'll get to that in a little bit, what, what that's all about. All right. So, Shannon, listen, we, we, we have friends who are men who are sensitive dudes. We have passive aggressive back and forths. Talk to me about Loki and Mobius here and the, the, the <laughs> kind of like, you know, oh, you betrayed me. Well, you betrayed me more. Talk about me, uh, this. And then also, of course, the, the a little bit more about Sylvie and Loki in these two scenes. I mean, what really made me laugh was it, was it was essentially the shut up. No, you shut up. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the type of back and forth that I think you can have with someone that you're incredibly close with. Yeah. And you are really angry at them, but you don't want to hurt them. Right. And even Loki, or uh, uh, Moby is putting Loki in the time cell. He knew, he knew like, this is real. This is going to annoy the crap out of him, <laughs> and it's going to get painful. <laughs> this isn't going to permanently hurt you. Frost giants um, notoriously have very strong constitutions when it comes to their downstairs. So, uh, you know, how many times can he get hit? 
We'll find out. <laughs> the thing that I thought was really interesting is, you know, you were talking about that sort of, uh, Laura was talking about that genuine moment, that genuine moment of connection between Loki and Sylvie, yeah. where he's giving her a compliment, which I don't recall ever seeing that in the films. I don't know if Loki was ever really in the position to do that. Maybe Thor Ragnarok, maybe Dark World. I don't, but I'm not recalling it. It reminded me of the moment at the end of the episode one when he is when he is on the run from the TVA inside the TVA. He's on the run from the Minutemen after yeah. uh, Mobius has asked him, "Do you like hurting people?" And yeah. you get that moment, that just sort of true moment of honesty. Like there's just a change in his eyes, and you see, you saw that same change in this scene with Sylvie right before, right before them, uh, uh, they 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 are brought back to the TVA. Something that I thought was interesting was those two portals open up, and we don't see did they go in or did the Minutemen come and get them? Oh, good point. Which yeah. I which I thought was interesting. interesting. I mean, yeah. my guess is that after on the on the on the heels of them saying like we, or Loki saying we're survivors that they would have gone in. But the mm. fact that, you know, you have this great kind of slow-mo shot, remind me of the first Avengers as the shield, uh, the shield mm. uh, soldiers are kind of walking Loki in, in the helicarrier, that you see <laughs> how many more guards Sylvie has. <laughs> and immediately after this great moment of honesty, <laughs> Loki latches on to this, so true. to this sort of petty, like, you, you think she's dead, I'm dangerous. Like, this is, this is disrespectful right now. Um, and I'm really curious what they had to do to convince Jamie Alexander to be like, hey, we're gonna give you three lines and we're gonna have you say them 85 different ways. <laughs> Uh, I think what, Thor zeroes that on that paycheck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I right. That's what that was. And I think she'll be back. I think they said for Thor. She's coming back for yeah. So, for, uh, I, I missed her in Ragnarok, so it's nice to see that she'll be coming back for sure. And she's alive, right? Because well, uh, everyone else, I think, has been uh, was killed by Hela, so she yeah. gets to stay alive, even though she was probably blipped. She gets to stay alive in the whole situation. She got, to stay, she got to stay alive because she wasn't available to shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, see, worked out well it for her. Galaxy works. brain. No, I was really uh, yeah. excited to see her in this episode. Like, I yeah. just like, when she showed up, I was like, oh my God, it's Sif. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, and, and one last thing. It seems like she is, it uh, seems like, uh, sorry, it seems like Mobius is showing Loki the other truth here in his world. Uh, as much as Loki is trying to reveal the truth in Mobius's world. And there's a line coming up where I think that really hits home, and we'll get to that. Both of them are removing these previous realities from each other's lives mm -hmm. and showing them another real world they could exist in. So, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, we go to Ravona's office. Mobius lobbies to talk to Sylvie, wants to play both Lokis off each other. Ravona refuses, saying uh, Sylvie's too dangerous. Uh, and she tells him to work his Loki and sends him out the door. Uh, then he runs into Hunter B-15, and he reveals this thing. He says, I, I don't know why these orphan demigods are such a pain to us. We brought in Kree, Titans, vampires. Okay, that sounds like Blade. Or, or what? More Morbius with the R Morbius. if they make the jump. Uh, possibly, we shall see. Uh, and then uh, B-15 asks if Loki said anything to him. He says that, yeah, the TVA is lying to him. Uh, and then B and we sense that B B-15 is trying to get at something. She's kind of doing her own investigation in her head. We're back to Loki, who's trying to reason with Sif. And he, he reveals that, you know, I'm a narcissist because I'm scared of being alone. And I crave attention. She helps him up. And instead of kicking his ass, she emotionally kicks his ass. And let me tell you something. That can be worse than getting you your your butt physically beat up when she says you are alone and you always will be and that kind of hammers the point home just then mobius shows up and they head to his obvious office mobius wants to know how the tva is lying to him how the two loki's work together loki says to let him go and he will tell him and tell him another truth about the tva as well uh the morbius girls about working for sylvie loki is insulted at this it's almost like he's describing a relationship. She's difficult and irritating and tries to hit me all the time. And yeah, that happens. Let me just say that. And Moby's passive aggressively tells him, of course, you don't do partners unless, you know, it's like to help you and then you can betray them at some point. Uh, and so they had that, another shot at, the, at their relationship here. Moby, uh, Loki pushes back and says, you know, well, down there, which I imagine he's referencing Earth or other planets, people turn on each other all the time to stay alive. That's what they do. It's not that big of a deal. So uh, Moby pushes back, and then Loki just shuts down. And looks like the interrogation is over. He sets up the door to send him back to Lady Sif. 
Then Loki starts to lie because he doesn't want to go back there to get his butt kicked again uh, about pulling the strings all along, blah, blah, blah. And he says he'll dispose of, uh, of Sylvie after the big thing they've planned happens. Uh, Mobius tells him that it's too late, that they already took care of her uh, and killed him for killed her for him. And Loki is surprised by this. Mobius says that Hunter B-15 took her out. Then Mobius calls him out for liking Sylvie and then totally rakes him over the coals for being this massive narcissist for falling in love with a female version of himself. Uh, Mo then Mobius tells him the truth that she is still alive for now. And they go back and forth until Loki finally reveals that they are all variants. He blurts this out, out and that the TVA stole them, brainwashed them into being workers. Mobius cracks, uh, Mobius cracks a little bit, believing it, recomposes himself, closes the case, and then sends Loki back into that uh, uh, time cell. Loki gets one verbal shot off before he leaves. Mobius is the biggest liar in this place, not for lying to him about uh, uh, Sylvie, but for lying to himself about what's happening here. Emma, whew, this is a weighty, weighty conversation overall and uh, with uh, the Hunter with Hunter B-15's uh, kind of growing suspicion that something more is going on here. We're really barreling now towards some uh, some answers on this episode. Yeah, this was really the moment wherein I went, oh my God, Hunter B-15 saw her past life. Yeah. And I was so excited oh, to wow. see what they were. I was so excited to see what they were going to do with it. And obviously mm -hmm. we'll talk about that in the next section. And I, like if my neighbors were walking by, because my apartment <laughs> building is pretty well insulated. But if you're walking right by someone's door in the hallway, you can hear what's going on. They yeah. would have thought I was watching sports. Um, <laughs> I was cheering <laughs> at every turn on this episode. But anyway, so. Again, the character of Mobius to me has been so fascinating from the beginning, specifically yeah. because he is this incredibly decent, likable man. Yeah. And to see Loki really play on that and end with that whole conversation of, yeah, you know what? You're the biggest liar in this place because you are lying to yourself and playing mm -hmm. to like the fact that he knows that in Mobius's heart of hearts, he knows that something is wrong. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mobius trying all of these scare tactics on him of, oh, we already took care of the girl. Like Loki sees right through that. But Mobius also sees right through Loki. And that's what's so compelling about this relationship. And one of the real strengths of the series is the relationship of all the other primary characters at this point to Loki in Mobius and also in Sylvie slash Lady Loki, that there is this incredible chemistry that they have mm -hmm. um yeah. and and so again like it was so like their relationship has been so consistent throughout where you have these two guys that got along pretty well and now you're seeing them really call each other out and not in a way wherein they're trying to one up each other but in a way where they really are like going for the heart and the truth yeah. of it all yeah it's almost like he's trying to deprogram a person out yes of the cult. And yes. they both listen, and the person is cracking a little bit, but then but isn't fully ready to break open because they've got to go on their own journey of answering these questions and, and figuring this out. Yeah, you can't deprogram someone that doesn't want to be deprogrammed. Lord no. knows. Uh Shannon, what do you think? What stood out through these interactions here and also the stuff with B15 and Mobius as well? Uh, definitely uh, Winmi Masaku, who plays B-15. Oh, yeah. She's doing some She's really, great. really great work. I mean, sometimes when you're five or six on the call sheet, I mean, you don't necessarily get those big moments that number one is going to get, number two is going to get. And she is making the most out of every single opportunity yeah. that she has. That moment where you see, it's almost like if you're driving a stick shift and the gear skips. Mm. There's that moment when... when uh, when Owen Wilson says, you know, like we're you know, uh, talking about like the past life, the memories, and you see like, oh, my God, that's what that was. Like you can mm -hmm. see that in someone's eyes. So just really, really great work for her, uh, from her. And also Owen Wilson has some of the greatest lines in these interrogation scenes, starting in episode one and also in episode this or uh, episode four, when the, 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 the cockroach survival mechanism <laughs> yeah. that he throws at Loki. I'm like, that is a harsh harsh insults yeah. like okay were you you know what was that or is, is this just a cockroach trying to survive um when he talks about 
the connection that Loki had with Sylvie. Like, you know, that's enough to break reality. It's breaking my reality right now. What an incredibly <laughs> seismic narcissist. <laughs> and I don't remember what preempted this line. It was something with the it was something with the timekeepers. But yeah. Bowen Wilson says, I ought to box your ear. It's, yeah, yeah. He says the timekeepers are a fake or a lie. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's something yeah. that I would expect like my great uncle to say. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, just I mean, obviously we're getting a lot of good we're getting a lot of good character development, a lot of good world building, but little gems like that are I think what mm. make the show as special as it is. Absolutely. Uh, Laura, what what jumped out at you here and what were you taking from this uh, developing relationship here that seems to be fraying on the edges between Mobius and Loki uh, overall? Well, I've been wild about the chemistry between these two from the start. Mm. And this scene just, I think, further enforced that. But I think I, I have to hand it to the Hiddleston performance in particular yeah. in this interrogation scene. Um, this line that he has at the beginning where he says, you know, she's difficult and irritating. She tries yeah. to hit me all the time. It could sound very juvenile, I think, coming out of, of you know, some actors' mouths. And I think that this is a very, like, it, it could also comes off, come off as like a very clumsy line in the mm -hmm. wrong actor's mm -hmm. hands. But it, it just comes off as so genuine and so perfect the way that Hiddleston delivers it. And he's got a couple of those moments in here. You know, we see the moment where you know, I, I think it's right after this where Mobius tells him, you know, I guess you don't do partners unless it benefits you and you can betray them at some point and benefit yourself even further. And you can see the genuine hurt yeah. in Loki's face in this moment. Yeah. And so it's it's a very, it's a sort of slow progression through a very long interrogation scene, you know, of two guys just sitting and talking to each other. This could be very boring, but they, they keep it really interesting. And you can you can really watch, I think, the Loki performance breakdown mm -hmm. as as we're getting into this, particularly as he as he progresses to the part where he says that that uh, the variant had been had been pruned, because yeah. um, yeah. we see sort of, we see Tom Hiddleston sort of carry on for a minute, you know, in sort of keep up, you know, this this charade he has going, but then starts to falter. That's the moment, mm -hmm. um, right when you know he starts to. It, it, it starts to, you know, break a little bit. The fact that forming the romantic relationship and, you know, breaking chaos and it could break reality is just, it, it, it not to be the person that brings up Star Wars, it could, that did sound a little bit Kylo and Rey to me in The Rise mm. of Skywalker. You know, you've got two that are one where their relationship just really can't, doesn't seem to be able to exist um, mm. together or apart. The seismic narcissist line was amazing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as as Loki learns that, yes, Sylvie is in fact alive and Mobius delivers that line very quietly in response to Loki saying it very loudly and you can just see that relief on his face. At this point, Loki's not holding back anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's, it's sort of breaking down and now the sort of true reaction. He's not hiding it from Mobius anymore, I think, just probably because he's tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and because it just, it was, in our best interest to get an outstanding Tom Hiddleston performance. And I'm mm -hmm. so grateful for that. Um, but yeah, the, this like, back and forth and accusing each other of lying, um, it, it just sort of, you know, led to these really touching moments. The idea that Mobius might have had a family in a past life. Mm. All of this is like just it's such intriguing storytelling. So I, I think for me, of all of that, it's the Tom Hiddleston performance and that whole scene. Owen Wilson definitely playing off of it as well. But that yeah. it, it just really did it for me. That's a fantastic point, Laurie. When you see him looking down at the ground, and remember, and I think you can look at this whole episode and see this as Loki discovering that he's falling in love with, or he has fallen in love with Sylvie throughout this episode. When he delivers that line of her being difficult and irritating and tries to hit him all the time, he's looking at the ground as if he's almost like, like he's surprised by it. And he's just like, well, it doesn't, wait, do I like her? Do, am I having effect? Like you see this developing with him because yeah. he's, it's all new. When he says this later on in the episode, I, I don't really do this. I've never had any practice doing this. So he is discovering this as it goes along. And it's almost like a childlike approach to it, right? The, the, the kid that pulls the pigtails, the, the, you know, the, the one that make fun in the sandbox. It's the one you mess with the most that you actually have a crush on. So it's kind of like that. It's almost infantile in his approach to it because he's trying to figure it out as it goes along. And I love him playing that color. And that moment where Owen Wilson just pauses for a second, you know, you immediately, if you've been watching the show, go back to the jet ski thing and go like, oh, 
was there a past year? So it's it's just great stuff from both of them. Uh, all right, we cut to Hunter B15, who is clearly unsettled. Uh, here she is staring at that poster that says, did you get them all? Verify through deletion. Uh, she walks uh, into the cell of Sylvie's cell and confronts her. Then she surprisingly opens a portal and they both go through it. We cut to Ravona's office. Ravona and Morbius are signing paperwork on the Loki case. I, I don't know. Am I the only one that's like, why are they, this is so weird to sign paperwork. What is this all about? <laughs> is it because all the humans are variants so they're trying to make them believe that no, this is an it's office? A, it's in, yeah, I, I think that's what it is. It's it's that familiarity of the office. It's it's yeah. a little like uh, like WandaVision. What was, yeah. what was Vision doing for a job? Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's very reminiscent of that, I think. And, yeah. and, and again, it's all very much in line with the idea of the TVA being this boring on the level bureaucracy. Right. It's like the DMV. <laughs> it know? really is the DMV. That's true. Uh, and, they, and they're signing paperwork on the Loki case. It's officially closed. They're sharing a drink. And then she asks him as like a post drink thing, you know, hanging out. She asks him if he can go anywhere, anytime, where would it be? And he says, well, I can. I can go anywhere, anytime. Uh, and Bobis doesn't an answer and instead asks why Ravona wouldn't let him question Sylvie. Then she tries to distract him again says, and asks the question again. He says, well, I, I just like being here with you doing the work. Uh, and she says the time keep now. She senses there's a little bit of a shakiness here. So she says the timekeepers want to personally oversee the pruning of the variant and they want you there. And he's like, well, it's about time. And he says it's great. Then asks her about when Hunter C20 started falling apart. So he's not letting this go here, kind of interrogating Ravona when they're supposed to be having the drink. And you imagine they've had multiple post-case drinks in this office together. So this is a fracturing of this relationship that Mobius is questioning Ravona constantly. Ravona stonewalls him that goes back at him. He says something seems a little off, and she responds that she is protecting him from the timekeepers, or sorry, protecting him from Sylvie, and that she, she saw what Sylvie did to Hunter C20 and doesn't want that to happen to Mobius. Is that what you want to hear, that I don't want you to have? And then says, uh, to anybody. I don't want it to happen to anybody. So he's she's using his affection a little bit in this situation to kind of cover up what's going on here. Uh, she calls them friends against time and that their friendship is uncommon and worth fighting for. And he distracts her with where she's going to put that trophy, that sword. Uh, and as she turns her back, he switches his temp pad with hers. He gets up to leave rather hastily, which makes her suspicious. And they say goodbye to each other in this situation. Um, let me go a little bit farther and then we'll cut. Then we go back to Rock's cart with Sylvie and B-15 in the rain. B-15 wants to know what Sylvie did to her when she was in her head. Sylvie says she showed her a life before she was at the TVA. B-15 says it's a lie. Sylvie says she can't create memories. She can only use the ones you already have. She says the timekeepers took their lives from them. That's what Sylvie says to B-15 and that they are both variants. B-15 asks her to do it again and B-15 is taken back to a place where she was happy and we see her experience it and then say that, but we don't get the flashback. So mm. Shannon, I go to you, Shannon, on this. I think you're next up on the run here. What did you think about these two scenes and what was happening here between both, all four of these people uh, in these two separate scenes? Well, to the paperwork question that you had, like when you yeah. look at the TVA, when you look at the staff, the, the analysis, the Minutemen, everyone seems to be human. So yes. who is like whoever the you know the big bad is controlling everyone? It's sort of like to your to your uh, cult argument. Um, what's the easiest way to get you to comply? It's to get you into a routine. Yes. And what is more routine than paperwork? Than showing up? Than showing up at your little cubicle? You have your assigned task. This is yeah. what you do, and that's the easiest way to get you not to question things. Is to put yeah. you into a familiar routine. Right. Um, with the, the scene between Mobius and Ravona, where you can kind of sense him kind of poking a little bit. And when she says the timekeepers want you to be there for this pruning, that's an execution. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, essentially, it's like, okay, yeah. we want you to be there. Like, if that's not an indicator that these are bad guys, <laughs> like, I don't know what is. <laughs> and to Emma's point earlier about, about, uh, Mobius just being this good, this good guy, this kind of pure guy, that's exactly why he was able to switch those tin pads right in front of Ravona is because mm -hmm. throughout their history, throughout their histories, maybe, 
he's never done anything like this because yeah. he's always he's always complied. Mm -hmm. The scene where they go back to rock to uh, Roxgard with B15 and Sylvie, oh. I mean, it was very. I, I kind of had like my John Roca moment, like you know, you know, Johnny often sees things that I do not, like these sort of metaphors, and like they go into this storm, and it's like that's literally where B15 is. Yep. Is that the, the 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 peaceful world or or the established world that she known has been turned uh, turned on its head? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it is just a storm now. Everything's uncertain. And when you see that moment where you 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 get that moment of peace, that moment of of uh, uh, remembrance almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was a that was a beautiful scene. Um, again, really, really great work by Wumi Masaka. Yeah, shout out to Wumi Masaka. For those of you who may not know her too well, do yourself a favor, watch the last season of Luther. She is stellar in the last season of Luther that has been released. She's all throughout that. Uh, 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 throughout that series, she's fantastic in that season, rather. Uh, and you got to watch her work. She's great, great stuff. Great British actress, for sure. Yeah, Laura, a lot happening here. We don't see the flashback, so my mind goes to, oh, was there a relationship between uh, uh, B-15 and C-20? Maybe they were the ones who are all the way back, and that's the memory she's having, because all she says is, I look happy. That's all she says. And then, of course, we get a little bit more of the cult stuff here with Ravona using multiple tactics, being very insidious in her way of kind of throwing him off the scent, kind of playing to his effect, letting her walls down a little bit to suck him back in by saying, "Do you what? did you want to hear me say they didn't want your mind messed up? You know, showing some affection for him. Very, very interesting tactics being used here by Ravona. What do you think about both of these scenes? Well, I love the scene of her starting out with the, you know, if you could go anywhere, anytime, where would mm -hmm. it be? And the, the callback that we get to that later is is particularly interesting yeah. in how they, I, I love how they bring it back. But this is, you know, where I'm starting to just get more and more angry at Ravona. You can see all of these little cracks starting to form. First, you've got her talking to to uh, Mobius about how he let the other variant get away during the first interrogation, but she doesn't make eye contact with Owen Wilson when she says it. She turns away and says it. She's clearly uncomfortable. And then we see her shift tactics again, and it just gets more and more manipulative as mm -hmm. this scene goes on. So it was fascinating to watch um, in, in terms of other performances to see this actresses, this actress in. Check out The Morning Show on Apple TV. Oh, it is yeah. an incredible so performance. Oh, yeah. man. Everybody's good on that show, but she's particularly She's great as uh, Celadon also in the Netflix Dark Crystal. She's the voice of ah. one of the characters. Ah. Right on. Got it. Got yeah. it. Um, yeah. yeah, the fact that she's <laughs> that, yeah, Owen Wilson then takes the temp pad. I found that really interesting that she wasn't more suspicious of something like that. At this point, they've been sitting here talking. She's getting more. He's obviously questioning more and more about what's going, what's really going on. And she still doesn't hesitate to turn her back on him for a few minutes. So mm -hmm. it, it, that I thought was an, an interesting mistake to watch on her part. Um, as for this, this, this scene with B15 and Sylvie, I was sort of surprised that they didn't show us the flashback too. Yeah, right. But at the end yeah. of it, especially upon a rewatch, I kind of thought, you know, I I think I enjoyed watching this sort of interaction play out between these two actresses in this scene. I don't think we needed it. Whether okay. or not we get it, maybe in the future, who's to say? But I think this scene in particular, as I was watching and waiting for it to happen. I ended up sort of, I think, coming to the conclusion, like, we didn't need this at this point. I love the end of it where she's, you know, she's crying and we get her voice a little bit higher pitched. But she's like, I looked happy. And it's all Sylvie does is nod. And it's all playing out just between the looks between these two women in this scene. And it's just perfect. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate how they ended up choosing to play it out that way. Yeah, that's great points you make, Laura. And another uh, reason for Rain, uh, 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 Shannon, is symbolism. Rain washes away things that mm -hmm. were covering up, and you see what's really there. So, what was underneath? What What do you think about this whole these two scenes here, Emma? What stood out for you? What really kind of hit you as you were watching both of these scenes? Well, as we were having this conversation, and I think Roca, you were starting to sort of insinuate this idea. It has dawned on me that mm. perhaps the reason we didn't see the flashback. It's because we've already seen the flashback. <laughs> oh, in the scene with, oh my God. That's like, great, what Emma. if, what, if, especially because Damn. she was enchanted by yeah. Sylvie, what if the relationship that she has with C20 actually dates back to 
their lives before they were just a designation right. and when they were people. Right. I'm not saying it, that's, this is getting a little tinfoil hatty, but <laughs> I think it was very intentional that the flashback was left out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's my theory now. And I'm just making that statement in case it's true because it'll be wild. Um, <laughs> yeah. But also I, I did not question the fact that Ravona didn't question Mobius, quite frankly, because again, it's that whole idea of him being somebody who is so likable. And also mm -hmm. we previously had that and who just complies and he's a good, he's a good salary man. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but they did also have that conversation in, I think maybe episode two, where they talk about how there was the ring left from his glass on the table that he didn't remember leaving. So I wonder if maybe there is a little bit of a, uh, a level of them feeling that they have this additional level of control over him or something else has been done to him in the past that that would make him to seem to be like extra compliant, thus lending to the idea that, because I think that with when he's constantly questioning about like, oh, what happened to C20? What happened to C20? Like you do get a little pushback from Ravona, but I think it comes from a place of like, oh no, like why is this extra, is this extra good boy questioning things? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, and again, and again, that was another, another like sports moment I had when, when <laughs> he switched their temp pads. I, I don't know. I was just very invested in this whole journey. Oh no. Oh uh, yeah. I, I love that. <laughs> um, and yes, I, I hadn't thought that they were the two people in the bar uh, with uh, that she's the one saying we're best friends and blah, 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 that it was actually maybe uh, B-15 who was back there with C-20. It was those two. Hadn't gotten that far in my uh, uh, in my uh, tinfoil hat thing about yeah. this. So who knows? That's a great point. It hadn't even occurred to me. So great stuff there. Yeah. All right, let's keep, let's keep uh, going on here. What's the next thing? We cut to Re Mobius in the library with Ravona's temp pad. He watches the interrogation of C-20 and sees that C-20 is trying to tell them all that they are variants, that they had lives before this. And we see Ravona turn off the video. It's like something out of a, I don't know, out of a detective uh, uh, show where you've seen the, the corrupt detective go turn off the tape right on camera. He zooms in on her. Uh, Mobius is, as I said, shook in that library. Uh, we go back to Loki in the prison. Mobius shows up. He is frantic. He's like, do you really think you deserve to be alone? Just ask him this really interesting question. Do you really think you deserve to be alone? The Nexus event where the two Lokis connect, he says, can bring this whole place down. He makes him swear that they didn't implant the memories, that Logis cannot implant the memories. Uh, and he says, no, he can't do that. And then Mobius reveals that Loki was right. He's been right all along. And then if he wants to save Sylvie, he has to trust him and come along with him. Then Mobius says what I wrote here, this awesome fucking line. You can be whoever or whatever you want to be, even someone good. I, I mean, just in case anyone ever told you different. It is one of the sweetest lines anyone can ever say to anybody who's in a moment of, of like questioning himself, not knowing what he's going to do. And we're seeing Loki in a, in a, in a transition period in his life throughout this series. And that moment was just beautiful, man. Uh, they come out of the portal. Ravona is waiting for them with her minute man. She asks for a temp pad back. Uh, you know, Mobius tries to feign like it was a mistake, but when he knows he's caught, he answers a question from before. This is the payoff that if he could go anywhere, he'd go back to where he was before the TBA and probably riding on his jet ski. And then he is pruned right in front of Loki. I'm not going to lie to you. I stopped it for a little bit. I, I got a little emotional when that happened, especially seeing Hiddleston's reaction because he can't do anything because he's got the strap around his neck. So he can't do anything. He has to have, watch this man who just said this most beautiful thing to him get killed right in front of him. Uh, and even Ravona can't look when it's happening. She looks away and squeezes her eyes closed. What is going on here? All right. Uh, she look and then they take Loki uh, and uh, she tells them to take him to the elevator. And the music cue here when they're taking Loki to the elevator is just stellar, just stellar. And then Ravona confronts Sylvie, finds out Hunter B-15 was with her, and she puts out an alert claiming B-15 has been compromised by the variant. All right, Laura Kelly. Woo! So much going on here. So much in these interactions oh. between Mobius and Loki. And clearly the the walls are coming down around this reality that Mobius thought he was existing in. What did you think about all of this? 
Yeah, I, I totally agree about the detective novel piece. I mean, she you see Ravona look directly at the camera and say, I'm <laughs> know, right? this and then turn it off. And it's just the perfect zoom in uh, <laughs> scene for Mobius to really start to understand what's going on. Um, I, I have to say this sort of like, we come back just momentarily for a little bit more play between Loki and Mobius and talking about, you know, we need to figure this out. The next yeah. event that you guys caused is like, it's going to bring this whole thing down. Um, and basically, you know, Mobius ends the conversation with like, so you're telling me that in order to fix all this, I have to like trust two Lokis. <laughs> and That's a great the moment. line that Tom Hiddleston delivers here is another one that just mm. would seem super cheesy in the mouth of another actor. He says, how about the word of a friend? And it does <laughs> look a little bit cheesy and yeah. it's fine, but it's just so perfect of an answer between these two in this exact moment. I just absolutely loved it. Um, mm -hmm. I totally agree about the music cues in this in these scenes. It's oh. great, but this is where this show is just. I, I sort of get the feeling that from here on out, it is just going to be nonstop yeah. because it starts here and it, the action just never stops, and it's almost <laughs> exhausting to watch it. I think the first time I watched through this scene, I like just put my computer. I I couldn't take notes during it. I had to just stop and watch it because <laughs> it was all playing out just way too fast for me to try and comprehend what was going on and take notes and write down my reaction and everything. And like, at one point I just have, holy shit in my notes. <laughs> um, I think when, unfortunately when Mobius gets pruned and you're right, that look oh. on Tom Hiddleston's face would just kill you yeah. seeing it. It's just, it's so, so sad and it's so perfect. But I'm like, there's this, like this can't be the last we're seeing a Mobius, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm kind of like, this isn't the last. We saw Baby Yoda in The Mandalorian, right? He's going to come back, right? He's, he's going to come back, please. <laughs> but yeah, this, uh, you know, putting out the alert for B-15, I think was just it, it, the icing on the cake for all of this, especially what it leads to in these scenes that we're coming up to. Um, yeah. And you do kind of wonder where she was. And I love the fact that, you know, we sort of, you can kind of, once you get through the second watch, it took me a second watch to realize this, but she went back. Yeah. to Ravona's office and got that sword, that trophy. And I just like love that. Perfect. Yeah. Absolutely. Emma, um, so as she pointed out here, so much uh, emotional um, beats are being played out between Mobius and Loki here. It's certainly ending with the possible death of Mobius, uh, but also seeing Ravona frantically trying to find the other uh, Loki or confront the other Loki and then frantically trying to get b15 captured as well because she senses that there's danger here to this world that's been constructed yeah i mean listen you brought up the line that mm. owen wilson said uh which you just needed to really put the icing on the cake of the relationship between mobius and loki assuming that this is the last time that we see mobius which again i hope not but if it is they ended it in such a an emotionally satisfying sort of way that was very mm -hmm. true to the journey that these characters had, which is to say that Mobius, Mobius is the person that wanted Loki to be somebody good. Yeah. Um. And, and to have him just literally say that out loud, I'm all about this kind of communication. This is a healthy <laughs> relationship. I love this friendship and I'm so sad <laughs> that Mobius might be dead. <laughs> but based on the end credits, he might not be, uh, or the, the post credit scene rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is, it is interesting to watch Ravona sort of process all of this stuff falling apart. Because again, this to me says that she is aware of what is going on with the TBA, mm -hmm. but it's that whole, it's, it goes back to that whole cult thing. It goes back to that whole cult thing of this is so much part of her identity at this point that we see that she is willing to do whatever it takes to maintain that yeah yep yep absolutely she senses that it's falling apart but oh she's yeah just she's got to figure out a way to keep it together for whatever her reasons are and i suppose we'll find out in episode five or episode six what her reasons actually are with all of this so yeah we're going to find out soon both loki's get into the gold elevator here with just ravona heading to the top with just ravona in the elevator she jettisons the minutemen and they're heading to the timekeepers sylvie asks if ravona 
remembers her. She asks why Ravona was oh, brought her in. Ravona cruelly. Oh, wait, wait, Shannon, did I skip you on this? Did you want to say something on the previous two scenes? I want to make did, sure. But, oh, so but go I... ahead. You have, you have something to add? I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about here, Pally. Sorry. I, 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 I know it's a lot. I Look, I can't echo anything better than Laura and Emma have. Um, okay. You know, that moment, like we talked about no waste, no wasted moments. Um, I wonder who that interrogator was. That when oh. who they were in there with C20. Oh. I, I was like, is this somebody? Is yeah. this somebody? It might not be. That might yeah. be a full tinfoil hat thing. Um, but also the the a lot of the lines that Mobius says to Loki, Thor has tried to say in yeah. his not so not so <laughs> delicate yes. way. And yes, you see you're that right. yeah, yeah. someone can get through to Loki. Thor, it seems like he eventually did after three, four movies. It <laughs> seemed like he did. Uh, uh, Mobius was able to do it in about four episodes. <laughs> so my, I, I definitely have a theory. I mean, I, when they come out of the office and, and Ravona's standing there, she's not happy about what she's going to have to do. No, um, yeah. I mean, you can see that on her face, but I definitely have a, a theory, uh, which we will discuss at the end okay. um, of, of the return. It, possible return of Mobius and how it ties into the comics. Okay. Okay. All right. Fair enough. And you're right. And you know what? Sometimes friends can get through to you quicker than family can. Family is wrapped up with a lot of stuff. And sometimes family can get through to you, but sometimes it's friends who are kind of outside the situation who get to look at it. So maybe that's why. And also, do you want to listen to the good looking dude with the big muscles and the gray hair getting all the ladies like, you know, kiss my ass. <laughs> it's the nerdy guy who like is really genuine and honest and speaking from his heart that sometimes can bring your walls down when you're a skeptical <laughs> guy like Loki. I'm just putting it out there. Anyway, all right. Both Lokis, as I said, get into the gold elevator with Ravona. Uh, Sylvie asks if Ravona remembers her. It's a great scene here. She asks why Ravona brought her in and Ravona even though she just got you know, a little bit emotional here, uh, not happy with having to kill Mobius, she cruelly smiles here and says she doesn't remember. Uh, and you go back to Sylvie and she is just like, you can tell she is holding back the hurt of that revelation. And, who, and I don't think Ravona is telling the truth either. The door opens and they walk in to face the timekeepers and the timekeepers speak to Loki's to the Loki's. This is the moment where like, this is all bullshit. This is the moment where I was like, this is all a lie. They give them a last opportunity to speak. There's that weird dude with the big old bah, 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 with the big <laughs> old I don't know what that was all about before they killed him. Sylvie says they are that the uh, timekeepers are scared. Loki says, You I've been killed before. Do it again. I don't care. Do your worst. And then Sylvie attempts to go after them, but Ravona keeps hitting the rewind button on her to stop her. And then all of a sudden, Sylvie starts to get Sylvie starts to get closer. And then the uh, and Ravona's like, "What's going on here?" And then you see the doors open, and out comes B fifteen through the elevator like a hero with her own pad, releasing the neck braces around the Lokis, and says, "For all time, always throw Sylvie the sword." And then a badass fight ensues. They take out everyone. Eventually, Sylvie confronts Ravona. They do battle until Sylvie knocks her the F out. And the timekeepers are seem to be doing nothing here. Then the timekeeper, one of the top timekeepers says to uh, Lady Loki, to Sylvie, you're a child of the timekeepers too, Sylvie. We can talk. Sylvie says, oh, yeah. And then throws a sword and cuts off his head. The others laugh. And then just as she's about to attack the others, Loki stops her. And then suddenly they all shut down like a theme park ride. So he grabs the head, realizes, and says they are mindless androids. And then Loki says it never stops and asks who created the TBA. Then Loki, in this moment, as things are falling apart, and we've seen this in numerous movies, right? This is the moment where you tell your truth to somebody when you've had this emotional, almost life-altering <laughs> shit might fall apart at any moment. Loki turns and tries to shoot his shot at Sylvie. Uh, but he is clearly not schooled in the art of putting his feelings into words. And she is not catching on. She is just not catching on. And just as he's about to say it, Ravona prunes him, oh. which is just a devastating moment. And then Sylvie disarms Ravona, points the pruner towards her, and Ravona asks her to kill her. And there's almost a pleading look in her eyes. Sylvie refuses and says that Ravona will tell her everything and then the episode ends we do have a post courtesy we'll get to that afterwards after we talk about this emma boom 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 talk yeah to me. okay so also it occurred to me because everybody's having all of these 
you know, Kang the Conqueror thoughts. And, oh, yeah. and we know that uh, the guy from Lovecraft Country, oh uh, God, what's the Jonathan actor? Major. Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan Majors. Majors. Yeah, yep. it, that Jonathan Majors is playing Kang the Conqueror. So Wumi yep. Masaku is also in Lovecraft Country and she's so, so oh. good in Lovecraft Country. Uh, oh. Yeah, she's a like again, hundred B fifteen, A plus plus. It's so cool to see somebody that again is like fifth or sixth on the call sheet, like getting all of these great moments, and that continues yeah. through in here where she like went back and got the sword. Another great like melee fight sequence. That is not something mm. I was necessarily expecting in this Loki series, but it's so cool to see these people and especially these women go in and just really throw down. Uh, so that was all uh, very thrilling for me to watch continuing through from last week um oh man uh the the revelation that the timekeepers were all just uh, a bunch of weird rock of fire explosion chuck e cheese creatures not surprising yeah but but effectively horrifying um and i i just yeah it was i i was blown away when when loki got zapped <laughs> oh, yeah that was a rough moment that was totally not moment. expecting that at all yeah yeah uh, all right shannon what stood out to you from this whole uh extended scene here in the elevator uh where ravona is cruelly smiling at sylvie and then of course the battles and the fights and and b15 coming in as a hero and then oh they're just androids or they're just robots mindless robots oh, the callousness of ravona's oh. response which you yeah. are which you already pointed out that Ooh. that mm. I don't remember <laughs> um, it, that that's so because I mean, one, I, as an audience member, I'm genuinely curious, like, what did this child do? Yeah. But then you see that, as you pointed out, that cold smile that she has where it's like, OK, she's in the service of somebody, but but she's still Ravona is still bad. I mean, Laura had pointed out earlier, like how her notes um, were just a lot of no. What? I mean, mine are completely <laughs> useless. I, I have no idea what I'm referencing <laughs> because it's all just monosyllabic reactions. Um, but then when they get in, I mean, I loved the design of the timekeepers. But the first time we see the one who's kind of hovering uh, yeah. at the top, I'm like, well, that ain't Jonathan Majors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then what I thought was interesting when they start having that fight. I don't recall them kind of turning their batons and using the pointy end. They've oh, always yeah. used the kind of radioactive end. So yeah. it, it made me think, especially as we get to the end of the at the end of the episode, it's kind of like, okay, now you're actually trying to kill them. Right. Like, that, like right. before, it has been a way to sort of delay it to kind of put it off. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, you know, you get that great moment between Loki and Sylvie. The moment's about to happen, and you know, he got Coulsoned. I mean, yeah. something he did not that long ago <laughs> to somebody else. That's um, a great point, dude. Scott Coulson. <laughs> Do you all now? This is something that I didn't see. Did B yeah. fifteen run away? I saw her hit the ground, but I didn't yeah. see her get killed. I didn't see her get yeah. killed or pruned or anything either. Yeah. She so just I, goes down pretty hard at one uh, towards the beginning. Yeah. Of it, yeah. Okay. 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 Well, she uh, looks she looks kind of hurt coming through the door herself. So sure. maybe there was the battle with the, all the other minute. Yeah, she fought her way in there. She is got what into I the elder. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, whatever whatever uh, revelation is about to present itself, um, Ravona is scared. Yes. Yes, like, I think yes. that's with, without a doubt. I mean, when she said, do it, like, you know, whatever you're going to do to me is going to be better than what's about to happen. Ooh, right. Yeah. That's almost scary to think about. It's a great point, Shannon. Laura, what stood out to you from these two scenes? What were the moments that really kind of caught your attention? I got to jump back to the Loki line. Of, is this the only reason you brought us here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kill us and says that I've lost track of the number of times I've been killed. So go ahead. Do your worst. I love, love, love that line. It's the perfect way to like to close out this episode, I think, in this scene. Um, but, but yeah, the fact that, you know, we've got, <laughs> the fact that these like, you know, cause he calls them like a cosmic disappointment or they call, you know, still be a cosmic disappointment. Like that was cold. Yeah. Ouch. You deserve to have your head cut off by that girl. But I got to say, <laughs> fuck yes. Epic hero moment for B15. I was a hundred percent here for this. So excited for all time. Always. She's got the line and then it just throws this. I just 
was like uh. screaming. This was my sports moment watching this. <laughs> um, but I got to say, Emma, I have the same thing in my notes of uh, re referencing Chuck E. Cheese. Where yeah. <laughs> these guys, the heads uh. off and they just kind of like flicker and power <laughs> down and just like, that definitely felt like Chuck. I mean, that, that it's like it's a small world, Chuck E. Cheese. It's right oh there <laughs> in that category, I think. Uh, but yeah, I mean, throne room scene from Last Jedi had major vibes oh, all yeah. over this. Yeah. Really, really appreciated that. I think mm. even like the last. I think as Loki's taking out the last guard and he sort of turns around like face he'll be, he, he might do like the exact same move in the exact same mm. rhythm that Kylo Ren does in, in The Last Jedi. So I, I was fully here for that, just for that comparison and those same feels alone. Um, but yeah, I, I had the same question in my notes of what happened to B-15? Well, back and watch I'm like, yeah, she goes down real hard at the beginning of it. Yep. Maybe she's just like laying in the blue mist. Mm. I, I don't know. Um, I think that, yeah, I'll be curious. Like she, we would have seen her get in the elevator, I guess. I, you know, I don't think mm -hmm. that that would be, a, of all the the thing that this show has accomplished, I don't think a continuity error like that is gonna be one of them. Right. So I, I think that there's gotta be some explanation there. But yeah, this moment between Sylvie and Loki at the end where he's like about to tell her like what, oh. I, I love you, whatever he's about to say, just like, oh, it just slayed me. It was so, so good. And I was so ready and just hanging on for him to say, it. and then the fact that in that moment he gets pruned yeah. from behind. It just, I didn't even think about the, the Phil Coulson connection there. <laughs> That's the sort of beautiful, I think kind of, you know, rhyming if you, if you will in that sense. But yeah, yeah that was just, it was just devastating. And then the fact that I did want to clarify before we dive mm. into the, the post credit scene, have we had a post credit scene in this show before? I didn't I don't miss think it, so. did Not I? in no. this okay. one. No. Okay. There was there was in WandaVision. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. But yeah, I was I was like, oh shoot, now I feel like I have to go back and watch it. Cause I was so excited yeah, to watch no. the first three. I just went yeah. through them real fast. Didn't even think to check. Fortunately, for some reason, I thought to check. Probably because <laughs> I was like, nah, they didn't they didn't just do that. They yeah. they didn't do that. There's no way. And I'm uh, glad I checked. A, there's a reason, Shannon had to go back and watch it a second time because there hadn't been post credit scenes in the previous three episodes. So that was the pattern and they changed the pattern here with this one. And rightfully so let's get into it. Uh, Loki wakes up uh, in the post credit scene and asks if it's hell and if he is dead, uh, Emma once again can clarify this, this a little bit more. She, he might be speaking of hell H E L, which is the yes. Norse underworld overseen by the goddess hell someone responds not yet but you will be unless you come with us it's an older voice who could that possibly be we cut to four other loki's three of them uh, standing there one with four feet uh, standing there richard e grant <laughs> richard e grant is fantastic in the old school loki costume there's a strong looking loki uh, who is called uh, what's he called? Boast, boastful, boastful loki. loki boastful loki then a young boy that's kid loki and then there's an alligator loki they're all staring at him i'm telling you right now i know there've been some great scenes in this, this show that shot is my favorite shot of the show so far. So, um, uh, Shannon, what did you think of this uh, uh, post credit scene? I mean, great reveal. Like, we were pretty sure that Loki was not going to be permanently gone. Yeah, right. But that reveal of the four of them, especially Richard E. Grant, I mean, oh, uh, I know there had been uh, uh, theories online that he's going to be the big bad. He's the one who's kind of behind everything. And to see that he's actually going to be part of the team rocking the classic green and yellow awesome but you look at the surroundings like it's they're clearly in like a demolished new york because there's a wrecked avengers tower right behind richard e grant mm -hmm. so the idea that okay if pruning someone doesn't necessarily kill them if it transports them to some other realm and if they have had to prune mobius before i'm wondering if uh at, at the conclusion of this series will the tva still exist and be more comics accurate where it's all mobius's Oh, good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Laura, we've got Kid Loki. Kid Loki is from the comics. We've got Alligator Loki, which is apparently <laughs> doesn't come from the comics exactly, but there's the Frog Thor that that uh, uh, Emma mentioned earlier in this show. And then, of course, that's classic Loki that Richard Grant is with a classic Loki outfit. Uh, and then Boastful Loki, which is this uh, African-American dude holding this massive uh, hammer and the great pelt on him. Uh, what do we take? What did you take from this post credit scene here? 
I was fully confused because I have no familiarity <laughs> with these comics and I was just, I was just confused. I mean, the, the most confusing thing for me at first was the cut right after the post credit scene where it said special guest Richard E. Grant. And my first thought was where? I totally <laughs> missed him. Like, I didn't even recognize him in like the classic Loki <laughs> outfit. I was just like, who's this old man in the yellow underpants? Like this is just <laughs> ridiculous to me. So the, the alligator, I also uh. missed the first time I watched this. I had to go back and be like, wait, there was a fourth figure in this? Yes, there was an alligator. Also had the little horns. Love that yes. little detail. Can't can't leave them out. Got to leave them in there just so we know exactly who we're dealing with. Um, I'm I'm really excited to see where this leads. This actor that was playing uh, boastful Loki. I found him on Twitter. Like doesn't Ooh. seem to have a ton of stuff to his name. So I think maybe a fairly unknown Ooh. actor, which is like awesome i think that's i think that's great that we're getting some unknown I, this unknown actor got to stand next like richard e grant like that must have been such a thrill yeah. um i would the whole time i would just be like like tell me about the rise of skywalker what was it like uh, <laughs> but he was yeah mm -hmm. the whole scene really threw me for a loop this is where like maybe some of the non-comic people might this is where they're going to be coming and looking for the the youtube videos to explain what the hell is going on because yeah. i needed all of that explanation just now um i i was Thoroughly confused, but thrilled just to see Loki alive. That was that was all I needed. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, Emma, thoughts on the post credit scene here? See, if I was standing next to Richard E. Grant, I would want to know all about Spice World, um, personally. <laughs> Do uh, okay, so yeah. So the hell thing is just an important distinction to make because hell, H-E-L, is just a location of the afterlife in Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. Norse mythology, afterlife, underworld is more akin to like a Greek mythology kind of thing where it's like, just because it's underworld doesn't mean it's bad. Like H-E-L has nothing in common with like the Christian concept of hell. It's like, no, this is just like where you go when you die. It's this weird in between. And also the thing that's weird about Norse gods is that and and this is all very much explained in the Ragnarok myth is they're like not totally immortal. They can die. Um, so <laughs> so Loki's reaction of is this hell is more like, is this the afterlife? I, Loki as a character would never assume that he was going to the bad place. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's <laughs> like, true. It's a great point. <laughs> uh, I just, how did they, I, I heard Richard E. Grant's voice speaking to Loki and immediately went, is that Richard E. Grant? <laughs> there he freaking was as just classic Loki. And it's interesting because the character of Loki in the MCU and in more contemporary Marvel comics is much more akin to the character of Loki in Norse mythology, who though an antagonist is a trickster, is mm -hmm. charming, it, you know, gets in with people and backstabs them. Whereas I feel like OG classic comics Loki is way more of a sinister kind yes. of villain. Yep. But yeah. then to see him with these other Loki variations, the kid Loki and the alligator Loki, uh, I, if you get pruned, does the, they're all Loki variants, clearly. Yeah. So it's like, if you get pruned, do you then just go to this sort of in-between limbo? Is that where they are now? And so does that mean that everybody that's been zapped with the, with the pruning sticks is also there? Right, right. If you think uh, if Mobius is there and if he thought trusting the word of two Lokis was tough, try trusting the word of six Lokis. Yeah. That's going to be triple tough for him to accept for sure. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of background. Emma's absolutely right. The classic Loki is way more devious, way more sinister. And him having the floppy horns so and all of it is just perfect because it it adds to the kind of sinister uh, aspect of it because you you uh, um, you underestimate him and because mm -hmm. of that. So that could come into play. Boastful Loki is new, so we don't know about him. Alligator Loki, as we said, is based on the frog Thor situation. So there is no alligator Loki in the comics, it was more of a play on that. But Kid Loki does <laughs> exist. Kid Loki is from Thor number 617, which came out in 2010. And this is when the God of Mischief had eventually run out of all his schemes uh, and people just could totally pick him apart. He surrendered himself to, to uh, in this event called Siege, where he was killed by the Void. Then he was reborn as his child self from back when he was a beloved and still relatively innocent kid. And, uh, and while he was still mischievous, Kid Loki tried to not repeat the same patterns 
of previous Loki and became a hero, helped his brother, saved Asgard a couple of times. But just as he was kind of, you know, embracing being this heroic Loki, the other Loki spirit that had been there before overtakes kid Loki, rides on his reputation. And so now you have two kind of uh, spirits of Loki fighting against each other inside this kid. So he does his mischievous stuff, but he's also caught up in the guilt for his actions because that's the innocent part of him that's still there. And he does eventually join the Young Avengers. So we've been hearing about Young Avengers. Did we see Patriot in Falcon and Winter Soldier? Are we getting Hulkling? We saw uh, uh, Wiccan in Speed. So this all seems to be laying some interesting groundwork as we go into the next phase of the MCU firmly uh, for sure. So you know, pay attention to all of that as we head on out of this episode uh, and uh, get ready for an episode five. Real quick, what do you want to see in episode five? Thoughts? Let's start with you, uh, Emma. What do you expect to see in episode five? Frog Thor. Um, <laughs> but what a great solution to get Thor into the Loki series without having to pay Chris Hemsworth. Uh, <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> uh, Mobius on a jet ski. That's what I. Uh, that's all I want. I just nice. like. I want Mobius to reappear on a jet ski and just be all in like Mad Max Freedom Fighter. Let's go. <laughs> all right, Laura. What do you got? Oh gosh, I don't know. That's the whole okay. thing is that I just feel like I'm along for the ride in this show. I'm just All happy right. to hear that that Loki's alive. I want to learn that Mobius is alive. I want to see him hanging out with all of his variants on the jet ski too. I, I just... I, that's all I really need. I need to get a little bit of maybe some explanation just to have faith that they're, they are making an effort to keep all of the audience in the loop of what exactly is going on. Um, but I, I, I have no doubt that we're going to get that at some point in the next couple of episodes. And then I want a season two because I'm just really liking where we're this direction that we're going in with this show. So that's, yeah. I, I know we're not going to get it, but still I want it. <laughs> uh, Laura's essentially wearing the lifeguard vest, hanging on to the back of the jet ski, hanging on to Moby. It's just along for the ride, having fun. Yep. Uh, yeah, Shannon, what do you got, Shannon? What do you got for next episode? What do you think? Uh, three on three beach volleyball comprised entirely of Moby. <laughs> yes. <movies. laughs> and as they finish their game, Mobius rides by on the jet ski. Uh, I think wow. they, have, they have actually, wow, nice fight. Uh, uh, I think they have talked about, I think they have talked about a season two of Loki. I don't think, I don't know yeah. if it's really? confirmed, but that yeah. is something that has been, that has been bandied about. Mm -hmm. um, Ooh, I figured it was all just going to snowball into a, a phase four and films and all that good stuff. So interesting. I, That's I mean, good to know. Certainly possible, but I mean, based off of the reaction, I, I mean, it seems like this is a, this, I, I don't, I don't know if it has eclipsed WandaVision yet. Um, but, but it, it seems to be very popular amongst the MCU fans as of right now, but yes, yeah. three on three beach volleyball. Okay. All right. Oh, I think uh, <laughs> at some. I think we're getting Kang at some point. I just think somehow either Ooh. four, uh, either five or six, we're going to see Jonathan Major show up as Kang. That's the one they've been kind of hiding a little bit. I think there's no way around that. Maybe they'll find a way uh, to do it. Uh, you know, trust all of them there, at Marvel. But. I think it would be very interesting to have Jonathan. This be where Jonathan Majors is introduced as K. Uh, all right. All right. That's our uh, spoiler review here for episode uh, four of Loki. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you're listening to us on the podcast feed, thank you very much for subscribing and downloading the episode as well. Uh, let's go around the horn here and tell everybody where they can find you. First of all, thank you very, very much for Laura Kelly sitting in for Mike Vogel. Laura, please. What do you got going on? Where can they find you? Sure. I talk about Star Wars on the internet, so come find me at my uh, my podcast, which is Force Toast, a Star Wars happy hour. You can find that at all the places that you find podcasts. Our Twitter handle is at Force Toast Pod. I am on Twitter at Shut Up underscore Laura, and I often am also tweeting about Star Wars. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, and then stay tuned for the end of the month. It'll be July 31st is the Schmodown Collision, where I will be taking on Andrew DeMolanta in the title match for the Star Wars belt. So go find me over there. And then John and I will be back talking about, you're over here, talking about Star Wars on the <laughs> Jedi way soon. Stay tuned for uh, our next episode where we just generally kind of shoot the shit about a random topic in Star Wars. We talk a little bit about what's recently in the news and sometimes we go live and bring people in and it's a lot of fun. So yep. stay tuned. There you go. Very well said. Emma Five, thank you so much again for joining us yet another week on the Loki. It's always, always a great when you're around. Please tell everybody what you got going on and everything going on in your world. 
Listen, uh, I'm at Emma Fife everywhere, all over the internet, wherever Emma Fife's are sold. Uh, I have, I'm gearing up to be more consistent about Twitch again. So we're looking at starting up Final Fantasy Fridays. I'm doing that this Ooh. Friday. I'm going to play the uh, the downloadable content for Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, and then I think probably by the time I finish that, the Pixel Remasters will be out. So I'm excited to revisit uh, Final oh. Fantasy's I think they have, I think it's three, four, five, and six. I'll probably start with six because I love six. Um, yeah. So, you know, just <laughs> that's, that's me. That's my life. I wrote a video for fandom called 16 Reasons oh. We Love Final Fantasy. If you go on a gaming wiki, it'll probably autoplay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good life. It's a good life. Uh, Shannon, what do we got to tell them? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media, on Twitter, it's at Geek underscore Buddies, on Instagram at The underscore Geek underscore Buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media, on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung, on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you would like to follow the absent Michael Vogel, it is <laughs> at MK Tune, and you can rub it in that his enchantment theory was wrong. Wrong! Yes, and wrong. <laughs> But he was right you... about the jet ski. He was right about the jet ski. <laughs> and if you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca says. Absolutely. Please. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel down below. So much happening here on the Outlaw Nation channel. Hit that subscribe button and that bell to see all the stuff we got going on. Trailer reactions, reviews, pre-produced videos, shows like this. All of it happening here on the Outlaw Nation. And as Emma mentions, Twitch. I'm on my fifth, sixth day of twitching. Wow. Is that what they call it? Wow, twitching. But, uh, twitching <laughs> sure. is that what they? I don't know what they <laughs> sure. call it, but yeah, I've, I've been having so much fun playing uh, my video, playing a Jedi Fallen Order, playing uh, Valhalla, the Assassin's Creed. Oh one, yeah, Valhalla's FIFA. fun. They're great stuff, and people have been coming along. So I'm, I think I'm one day away from becoming an affiliate, and then I'll start yeah. having watch-alongs from Amazon Prime, and I will program my first ever Outlaw Nation Film Festival. So those are the things Ooh. that I'm kind of building up towards. So please, come aboard that as well, as well as my social media. So much love to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to us. Uh, please leave a comment. Please, uh, with the podcast, make sure you, if you subscribe to the podcast, make sure you leave a review and make sure you leave a rating. Those things help us go up in the rankings, help us get seen, and get more and more people aboard the Geek Buddies train. All right, we're out of here. Take care yourselves be well and we'll talk to you next time for another spoiler review episode of loki from the geek buddies <laughs> hey!